Here we have a problem from the theory of partial differential equations. And it's quite a long problem with a number of uh, sub-questions. Let's look at what we're given. We're given uh, a heat problem, a special PDE. By the subscript, I'm talking about partial derivatives. And you can see that the boxed equation essentially um, is a second order linear PDE, partial differential equation. And it's coupled with some extra conditions. Here you have two side conditions or boundary conditions. Essentially, if um, V is a function of X position and time T, and you've got a, a homogeneous bar made of some material, V represents the temperature within the cross sections of the bar at position X at time T. Now the extra bits of condition, the extra conditions, this says that at the le on the left end of the bar, the temperature is always zero. What does this say? You see, you've got a derivative here. At the right end of the bar, essentially the bar is insulated. There, no, no um, heat can cross the the end of the bar. Okay. And the third bit of information says that the initial temperature is zero. Okay. Now, we'll come back to that in a minute. Given that V is a solution to this problem, whatever it is, we've now defined a, a function, I of T, via this integral. Now, it's a single integral, so it's a, and, and the dummy variable here is X. So actually, it's, a, it's really a function of, of time t. We're asked to do a number of things. The first three steps are reasonably easy. The final sub-question d is a little bit more complicated. So let's go through it step by step and see how we go. Apply Leibniz rule to calculate the derivative of this newly defined function. Now, what is Leibniz rule? Well, Leibniz rule is a rule that allows us to differentiate under the integral sign. Let me show you what I mean. OK, so I guess this is I dash. By, by I dash, I mean di dt. Uh, so let's start with a word. OK. So Leibniz rule says I can take that dt and move it inside the integral sign and change the straight d's to curly d's. Because if you look inside the integral sign, you've got a function of two variables. OK. Okay, so now what I'm going to do is, I don't know what V is, but I can still calculate the partial derivative of the square of it, right? Use the product rule, so V times V. So using the product rule, for example, the derivative, DDT, is just the following. So the 2 is going to come to the front. Let me adjust that. We integrate, we're differentiating with respect to t, so this should be v sub t, not v sub x. All right? OK. We might be able to do something with that later, because if you look, we might be able to do something with that, with that later, um, because if you look, you can actually maybe connect that with that, because remember, V is a solution to this problem, and maybe do, do the actual integration. 
okay, by parts. But let's not concern ourselves with that at the moment. Okay, that's good enough as far as I'm concerned. Okay, so write down the part B, write down, write down the value of the I at zero. Okay, so what is I of zero? Well, go through and plug in T equals zero. So, if V is a solution to this problem, what do we notice about V of x comma zero? It's zero. So the value of our newly defined function I at t equals zero is just zero. We got that from the initial temperature. Okay? Okay, so that's pretty easy. Now for part C, part C asks us to show that the derivative of I is less than or equal to zero, is non-positive for all t greater than zero, for all time positive. Okay, so how do we do that? Well, We've got the derivative of I from part A. Okay? What we're going to do is invoke the PDE and then do some integration like I suggested before. Okay? So it's getting a little bit harder now. Okay? So D, I, D, T, I dash. So that is the following. Now, if we use the PDE, I can replace V sub T with V sub XX. I can take that 2 out the front. Now, I'm just going to drop the, the, uh, the arguments just to make it a little bit more compact. Okay, so now what? What I can do is, um, remember, I'm integrating with respect to x, keeping t fixed. So I can possibly do an integration by parts here. Okay, so if I do an integration by parts in the following way, I'll get the following. Okay, so I integrate this, I differentiate this, I'll get V sub x squared dx. Okay, so what we can do now is use the boundary conditions. Okay. Now, if we look at the boundary conditions, this is here. That's zero. So this product has got to be zero. This ah, this is here. So this product of all, has also got to be zero. Okay, from the side conditions. Okay, so from the side conditions, that's zero, that's zero, so I'm only, I'm only left with the, 
the negative of the integral of something squared. Okay? So, if I'm integrating something squared and I'm taking the negative 2 of it, it's got to be less than or equal to 0. Okay? So I've shown that the derivative of this i function is less than or equal to 0. And I know that i of 0 equals 0. So what does it mean? It means that initially for x equals 0, for x equals 0, the function is, is, has a 0 value. Okay? And you know that for all x positive, the, 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 the slope has got to be less than or equal to 0. So you've got a function that starts at 0 that can't increase. It's got to either go flat or go down. Okay? So our conclusion for part C... Oh, have we done that? Yeah, no, we've, we've, actually, we've done that. We, we've actually showed that the derivative is, is um, non-negative there without it, without it actually doing anything else. Okay, so I guess the most difficult part of this problem is part D, and this is the, the problem where most students struggled with. Explain why there is at most one solution to the inhomogeneous heat problem that's listed down here. Okay, so what information have you got here? Before we attack this problem, let's look at what we've got. You've got a heat equation, but it's not homogeneous. You have this function f, which you don't know what it is. Think of it as a source term, something that's creating, creating heat. Okay? You've got the same side conditions. And then on the end, you've got a g of x, which is like an initial temperature. Part D asks us to use part B and part C to show that there is at most one solution to this, this general problem. Firstly, before we solve it, what's the point of a question like this? Well, the point of a, of a question like this, or the, the knowledge that, that's important with this kind of problem is, suppose you, you have a problem for some f and some g, right? You want to calculate the, the solution. Suppose you do calculate the solution. You know that it's the only one. You know that once you've found one solution, that's the only solution. Okay? You can stop. You don't have to keep looking around for more solutions. Okay? That's the significance of the problem. Okay? So how do we apply B and C to solve D? Well, it's a little bit tricky, so let me, let me talk you through it. What I'm going to do is assume there are two solutions to this inhomogeneous problem. And I'm going to show that the difference of those two solutions is always zero. Therefore, they have to be the same solution. Okay? Let me show you. So let u and v. So I'm going to call this the non-homogeneous problem just be star. Okay, and the aim is to show that the two are identically equal to each other. Okay? Okay. So how do we do it? Well, Let W be defined by the difference of these two solutions. Now you can show and it's pretty easy to do so. All you do, is, you can show that basically W satisfies the original homogeneous problem. Okay? So basically calculate the W sub XX, W sub T, uh, 
And you'll see that this comes up with V replaced by W. These two things hold and this holds with V replaced by W. Okay, so I'm going to call the homogeneous problem H. Okay? Now, because W satisfies the homogeneous problem, I'm just going to basically write this with V replaced by W. Okay, what do we know about this function? Now, hopefully you can, you, you'll agree with me. I must be a non-negative function because we're integrating the square of something. So I must be greater than or equal to, to zero. Right? Yes? And from part from part C what did we have? We had I prime is less than or equal to zero and I of zero equals zero. So if you have a function I it starts at zero and can never increase, the function I's got to be below zero or less than or equal to zero. Okay? Yes? So what does this mean? We, we, our function i is always greater than or equal to 0, and it's always less than or equal to 0. So what does i have to be equal to? 0, right? Something that's greater than or equal to 0 and less than or equal to 0 can, ha, has to be 0. So i is identically equal to 0. So what does that mean? Well. The only way that this boxed integral can be always zero is if the integrand's always zero. Okay? So from, so let's call this an exclamation mark. This W function is always equal to zero. So what does it mean? It means that the function u and the function v must be one and the same function. Okay? So there is at most one solution to the non-homogeneous problem star. 